Now, today, in the will of God, we're going to look at this question, is ignorance bliss? Having come through the last 52 Sundays, now we're at the 53rd question that we've looked at in this question series, none of us can say who have been listening each week that we are ignorant of the gospel, ignorant of the claims of God upon our lives. But maybe there's someone on this afternoon and you haven't been tuning in for the last 53 Sundays and this may be your first son tuning in. Well, we want you to listen very, very carefully while we preach the gospel to you using the word of God, the Bible. For that's what we have used week after week and we will use it again throughout the course of this message to explain to you the way of salvation, how that you must be saved from your sin and its consequence, which is eternal death and judgment, and how you can be saved because of what Christ has accomplished at the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection 2,000 years ago on your behalf, personally on your behalf. So we want you to understand this message. Now, I guess most of us would be familiar with that age-old saying, ignorance is bliss. It's fairly widely used in the world in which we live, but we want to put this statement to the test today, especially in light of eternal matters. Now, it's generally used as a figure of speech when one desires to be willingly ignorant of a certain matter. But ironically, there is much truth to the actual practice of this statement, ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is obviously defined as having a lack of knowledge in regards to something. Way back in 1742, there was a man named Thomas Gray, and he wrote, where ignorance is bliss, tis folly to be wise. Where ignorance is bliss, tis folly to be wise. Of course, he was writing tongue and cheek. No one wants to be unwise or ignorant. We live in a world where the clamor for wisdom is upon every hand. But examples of this statement can be made or known. We've just passed Christmas and much money has been spent in relation to presents, no doubt. And children could be blissfully ignorant as to how much those presents cost their parents. Or one could have blissfully enjoyed the Christmas desserts ignorant of how many calories were in it. Maybe one thinks it to be blissfully ignorant spending money on a credit card without reviewing the interest rates or the repayment deadlines. Some even think that by not tuning into the news, they can, they can remain ignorant, blissfully ignorant of to the, as to the sad conditions in this world in which we live and there are many many ways even to the point of sin some would imagine that they could be blissfully indulgent in immorality whilst the spouse of theirs is ignorant or others steal or lie yet there are many ways in which this could be used ignorance is bliss but in each of these examples we clearly can comprehend that being ignorant as to something does not change the reality. It does not change truth. If you go back to some of those examples that I've just used for you, it can appear to be blissfully, you can appear to be blissfully ignorant when you're indulging on that Christmas dessert, ignorant of how many calories are going into your body, but it doesn't change the fact of the calories going in. The cost of the holiday doesn't change. The credit card debt still remains. The broken world in which we live is not changed by you not tuning in to the news on the TV. You see, the fact and the realities remain, whether you are ignorant of them or not, or whether you try to be or attempt to be ignorant of them. But in all of these examples, I want to highlight one common factor in the entire human race where we use this statement or we attempt to use this statement, ignorance is bliss, and that is in relation to acknowledging God. 
consequences for personal sin. When it comes to sin, all of us have a nature that attempts to live blissfully free of acknowledging that there is a God. Or acknowledging our personal sin is not something that we like to think about. So we bury our heads in the sand. I, I have been guilty of that in my own life prior to being saved. I thought if I could bury my head in the sand, close my eyes to these matters, that somehow they would go away. But it doesn't change reality. Being ignorant and seemingly blissfully ignorant, we'll see by the end of this message that it's not blissful ignorance at all. But seemingly blissfully ignorant of these matters does not change the reality that there is a God. And there are consequences for personal sin. And that there is eternal judgment that awaits every one of us. I'm sure you would agree with me that in the earlier examples I used, it would have been best to actually face the facts or the truth that you have on hand first in order to make a rational choice or judgment you know before you go out and spend on the credit card it would be worthy to look at where what the interest rates are or what the repayment deadlines are before you uh, enter into some kind of action where where there are consequences it would be best to understand those consequences and it would help you to make a rational judgment or a choice. In fact, when you think about all of the examples I've used, and you can think of any example for that matter, there are always sufficient facts to inform the individual as to the truth, the reality of that subject or that matter or that action. There is always facts to inform you. <laughs> I don't think that there is a, a, a dessert in the shopping centers or the, the supermarkets that you can't turn to the back of the packet. Look at this. I've got a, I got a packet of chocolate right, right next to me. I didn't plan on saying this. It just happens to be on my desk because I got it for Christmas. And right on the back here, it tells me the energy and the protein and the fat total and the carbohydrates and the sugars. And it may be best. It would be best if I, if I looked at those facts But I want to tell you, my friends, that this is exactly the same when we come to God and sin and judgment and eternity and the Lord Jesus Christ. There is adequate testimony for us to witness to us of truth in regards to these matters. You know, God has set before you creation to testify as to himself. Listen to this. The Bible in Psalm 19 tells us this, that the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day after day, it pours forth speech and night after night, it reveals knowledge to you. You look up to those starry heavens of a nighttime and one thing you have to understand is that this is not random as those planets are fixed in orbit and those stars are aligned. You, you can plot your course by those stars. There they remain, night after night. Go outside and look at the starry sky of the Southern Hemisphere and appreciate that it was by design. This is the knowledge of God exposed before our very eyes, the creatorial handiwork of our God. It's right before us in creation. In fact, the Bible tells us there in Psalm 19, if you would just read it, that there is no language. There are no words on planet Earth. There is no language speaking people on planet Earth where the voice of creation, where the voice of the creator is not known and not heard. You could go to any part of planet Earth and creation testifies to the creator. The handiwork is before you, my friend. 
This very building in which I sit testifies to the fact that there was a designer and there was a builder to this building and the very universe in which we live testifies to a designer and a creator who alone is God. But God has also placed a conscience with you. You may turn away from creation and try and attempt to believe in evolution and say that it all began with a big bang and there is no God attempting to explain away. But there is a conscience within you which is unceasing in its voice. And you know to this very moment that the conscience within you bears witness, says the Bible, of the very law of God written in our hearts. You know it's wrong to tell a lie. No one ever had to teach you that. I have seven children for many of you who know me, and never once have I ever had to sit down any one of my children and teach them how to tell a lie or teach them how to be disobedient or teach them how to be envious or teach them how to act in violence or in any of these sinful ways. I never at once at any time purposefully sat my children down to teach them how to sin. There was something within them, this sinful nature, and the very fact that we have a conscience that testifies to us of our sinful nature is evidence of the very law of God written within us. And in fact, it tells us in that same passage in Romans chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, it tells us that our thoughts accuse us or else they, we try to excuse one another. You know, my friend, creation and conscience bears testimony to you daily that there is no such thing as blissful ignorance. It's staring you in the face. It's shouting from the, from the mountaintops, resounding through your conscience. There is a God. You have to meet him. God desires for you to be saved, to be ready to meet him. But you know, somehow we manage to bury our head in the sand and, and, and hope that it will eventually go away. You know, the irony I was thinking about this just uh, in the last few minutes prior to speaking to you, just sitting outside on the little balcony I have here and thinking about the irony of this statement, ignorance is bliss. You know, we try to bury our heads in the sand and hope that these thoughts of God and creation and that will go away. But the irony is we constantly acknowledge that we are ignorant as humans. Today is a landmark day in the field of astronomy. There has been the launch of the James Webb Telescope, $10 billion. This, this rocket carrying this telescope will travel for a full month until it reaches its orbital parking space, which is about a million miles from Earth. And do you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to understand how light first appeared in the universe. My friend, in the, the irony of this is that mankind acknowledges their own ignorance. But can I tell you what this book, the Bible, God's word, teaches us in the very first chapter and only the third verse? It teaches us how light appeared in the universe. Listen to what it says in Genesis 1 verse 3. It tells us, God said, let there be light. And there was light. There was light appeared in this universe. You see, interestingly, the first light was not from the sun or from the stars, as those tel as this telescope is attempting to, uh, to observe. It's going to, it's going to this part of outer space where it's going to focus on light objects and try to ascertain how light first appeared. Well, you know, light did not first appear from material objects like the sun or the stars. But it was from God himself, you'll know, in the creation week, they were created later. God said, let there be light. Light from God himself emanated. You see, where God is, 
There is light. Incidentally, that's what you need, my friend. You do not need material light to undo your ignorance, to inform you, to give you wisdom. You need spiritual light. And I am very thankful to tell you that God can give you spiritual light through his word. This is the way he opens your eyes and has opened my eyes to see my need of salvation, to see the desperate need that we have in sin, that we need to be saved. But if there was enough evidence in creation and the conscience for you to seek the Lord, God has been kind enough to reveal to you through his word. Further, in the scriptures, and by sending his own son into the world to, to make provision of salvation for the human race. You know, you only have to lift the pages of scripture again, and I would encourage you to do it. Listen, listen, my friend, let me make to you a statement from this very book. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You seek God through his word, you'll find him. And you'll find in Genesis chapter 3, at the very first outset of sin coming into this world, the very commencing uh, book of our Bible, just the third chapter, you'll find that God made a promise to the human race that he would send his son to crush the head of the serpent, which is Satan. And in doing so, his son would receive a wound a bruised heel. The prophets, you go through the Old Testament. Let me tell you some of the prophecies that God made. We're at Christmas time, aren't we? And how many shops have you been into and you've heard songs and carols concerning the virgin birth? Let me tell you, my friend, so many years before Christ ever came, born of a virgin, Isaiah in his prophecy in chapter 7, verse 14, he told us this, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Matthew tells us what this means. God with us. The deity of Christ. This was God manifest in flesh. Isaiah, the same prophet, tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ, God's son, would come preaching good tidings to the meek. He would bind up the broken heart, proclaim liberty to the captives. He would open the prison to them who are bound. Yes. And he would accomplish this ultimately by going to a cross. Read in Psalm 22, verse number 16, how his hands and his feet would be pierced. Isaiah would tell us again how that the Christ, the savior of the world, he would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, the price for our peace would be upon his shoulders. He would pay the supreme price so that you and I could have peace with God. Yes, my friend, it would be by his stripe that we can be healed. I love to go to scriptures concerning the resurrection of Christ. His soul would not be left in hell. The Holy One would not see corruption. It was not possible for the Son of God. It was not possible for the Lord Jesus Christ to see for that holy body to see any corruption in the grave. God raised his son on the third day. Yes, my friends, there are many, many prophecies still yet to be fulfilled concerning the second coming of Christ. He's coming again. And this child that was born and the son that was given, he will come to take the government of this world and he will reign from Jerusalem. And his name throughout the globe shall be known as Wonderful Count. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace, all foretold for us in the prophecies of the Old Testament. I'm very thankful to tell you, my friend, that you come into the New Testament, you start to read Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, and you read that when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, 
born under the law. Yes, Christ came in God's own perfect time, just the correct time. You know, you may look out at this world in which we live. And this will actually be something that I want to reference in a moment or two in slightly more detail. But you might look out into this world in which we live and wonder even if there is a God, it just seems that he doesn't notice what's going on. Time seems to go on and on. No change seems to take place. Let me tell you, my friends, that God is not slack concerning his promise of Christ coming again. He's not slack concerning his promise of the judgment, the ultimate judgment of sin. But he's long suffering towards you so that you can be saved. Go back to the gospel records. Read and understand, my friend, that Christ is died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen on resurrection ground by many many witnesses the indisputable evidence the infallible proofs says the bible concerning the resurrection of jesus christ ignorance no, my friend, you're not ignorant. You have creation that testifies to you of God himself. You have a conscience that bears witness moment by moment of the reality of your sinful nature, that it, it is against God, that you will meet God, that there is judgment and consequence for sin. You have the scriptures, those Old Testament prophecies and prom promises by God himself that he would send Christ to be the savior of the world, his only begotten son. Listen, my friend, let me quote to you again from the word of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes, my friend, God provided his son. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy was fulfilled. When Christ came, lived that life of perfect holiness, walked that pathway to a cross, his mission to bear upon his shoulders the sin of the world, to bear it away, says the scriptures, to take the judgment, to exhaust the judgment of God for sin, for my sin, for your sin. Do you understand that? That upon the cross, Christ bore the judgment for your sins in his own body. He took the unmitigated cup of wrath, the bitter cup. Love drank it up. Now blessings draft for me. Do you understand that? Do you understand that you are the sinner before God and God sent his son to be your savior? You see, my friend, you're no longer ignorant. The word of God testifies to you. The coming of Christ leaves you out excuse. In fact, we are taught in Romans chapter 3, around verse 19, how that the whole world stands guilty before God. Whether you've ever read a Bible or not. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, whatever you've done, you stand guilty before God. But I'm thankful you're here and it's of no coincidence that you're here listening to the gospel message. How that you could be gloriously saved, eternally saved by trusting in Christ. God commands you to repent. Oh, my friend. Friends, if I could stand upon the housetops and preach to you, if I could put my arms around you, implore you to repent, turn from your wicked ways, turn from your sin, turn from your religion, turn from your good works, turn from your baptismal certificate or whatever you may be tenaciously hanging on to, hoping to present it to God, it will be in vain. 
Satan, my friend. There will be nothing other than Christ and his work at Calvary's cross that finds acceptance with our God. You see, my friend, you need to trust Christ by faith. And God commands you to turn and trust Christ. And it's with the word of God in my hand and the authority of God behind me that I declare to you your need, your desperate need to be saved. You must be saved, my friend. You know, sadly, so, so, so sadly, there will likely be people on this forum this afternoon who willfully and willingly choose to ignore this truth, believing that their bliss will last forever. You know, some even think that the grave will eventually hide them. There was a man in the Bible, you can read about him in Psalm 73. His name is Asaph. And he acknowledged that he had come so close to believing a lie, the lie that, that when it came to sin and the wicked, that, that they were in bliss. And it seemed like that everyone, even God, was ignorant as to what they were doing. But it tells us in that psalm that when he but alone with God, in the presence of God, he understood that the wicked shall have a calamitous end. Justice will be served. Truth will prevail. You see, I may eat 10 bars of this chocolate, imagining that it will be good for my health and, and not bothering to read the statistics on the back of the packet, but it won't, it won't prevent truth from prevailing. You imagine that you can sin and get away with it and live in the bliss of ignorance as to God and eternity and what is yet future that lies ahead of you. But my friend, it doesn't change the reality. Hell and eternal judgment are an unavoidable reality for you. What about you this afternoon? Can I tell you a little story? You know, when I first began to be convicted about my sin, many times in my life, the Holy Spirit of God had spoken to me about my sin, and I cho chose to turn away time and time again. And I remember going along once in a truck where I was working for a man just 20 years ago in the city of Melbourne. And he would talk to me about my sin and the reality of being God and eternal judgment that, wait, that awaits. And I remember gripping onto the seat as I went along in the truck and saying to myself, I will just tell God I never read the Bible. I, I honestly thought that. I honestly said that to myself. I'll tell God I just never read the Bible. You really think that something like that would work, my friend? No, I wanted to bury my head in the sand and, and, and be blissfully ignorant, but I could no longer be. My conscience, it shouted at me. Creation testified. The word of God stood true. The fact that Christ had come and died and had been buried and raised again the third day for my sins, according to the scriptures, stood as an unchanging truth upon the history books, upon the word of pages of the word of God. And it was an unavoidable reality. You know, I remember once I came from Victoria to Queensland. 16 years ago or 15 years ago, approximately, we came up to Queensland for the first time and we had a caravan behind us. And on the back of that caravan, there was a, a uh, bike rack and it went up the middle of the number, just like that. And the, the rule down in Victoria at the time was you could have a bike rack going up your number plate, obscuring the number plate as long as it didn't get in the way or obscure any of the numbers or letters on the number plate. Well, when I came to Queensland, I got stopped by the police and this policewoman informed me that it was against the law to have 
anything obscuring the number plate. So I politely explained to her, well, it was a Victorian number plate. She could see that. And I explained to her that down in Victoria, you're allowed to have a bike rack over a, a number plate as long as it's not obscuring the letters or numbers. And you could see them very clearly. There was no issue in relation to that. She said, that doesn't matter. You're now in Queensland. And it's against the law in Queensland to have anything going over the number plate, period. And it was a $220 fine. And I said to her, but I, I didn't know. I've just arrived in Queensland. I didn't know that. She said, it doesn't change the law. And it just doesn't change the fact that I have to give you a consequence. You've broken the law. There's a fine for that. You see, my friend, you may imagine that you will be able to say to God one day that you will somehow plead ignorance. No, my friend. You are guilty before God. And God has made every provision possible for you to be saved. He has demonstrated his love towards you that while you were a sinner christ died for you he's declared to you himself in the glories of creation he speaks to you moment by moment through your conscience the scriptures stand as a testimony to you and i had to pay the fine you see my friend I couldn't have pled ignorance it wasn't possible. It wouldn't work. It wasn't going to let me off. Can I ask you again? What about you? What do you think of Christ? I'll quote to you a little poem. You know, for many in youth, they're too happy to think. There's time enough, sure. Manhood, you become too busy to think of gold, I want more. Midlife, you're too anxious to think. Toil, worry, sweat. Declining years, too aged to think. Old hearts, harder get. Deathbed, too ill to think. Suffering and alone. Death, too late to think. The spirit has flown eternally, forever to think. God's mercy is past, and I, am to, and I into hell am righteously cast to weep all my doom, which forever must last. My friend, this is the last Sunday of the year. 53 Sundays ago, exactly one year today, on the 27th of December, 364 days ago, we commenced this question series, inviting you to take seriously the message of the gospel. 53 questions have been posed to you concerning the way of salvation and eternal life. 53 times in the last year, men have pleaded with you to lay down your arms, to take Christ and find in him satisfaction. Find in him, my friend, everything that you'll need for eternity. Again, I beseech you today, as I close this question series with a statement from God to you, I beseech you, take Christ in him. You will find life, and you will find light, and you will find love. You will find true satisfaction. You will find bliss, eternal bliss. You will be able to lay your head upon the pillow with absolute assurance. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to his cross. That which was against me has been taken out of the way, nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Is it well with your soul? Is your trust in Christ alone? Can you lay down your weary head upon the breast of Christ? Just trust him by faith. Lord, save me. I close with this verse from the word of God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let's pray.